Well, good day, everyone. This is uh, Chris back again with the Ancient Scholar. So today I'm going to be talking about um, hemoglobin and, and some of its special properties. So as we know, hemoglobin is a is a very complicated protein. It's a complex protein that has uh, what's known as quaternary structure, um, and uh, it's a protein that actually has a, m m a metallic uh, component to it, iron. And the, the role of uh, this protein is to transport oxygen um, in the blood. Well, I, it, really, it's a threefold role. Um, it, it first needs to pick up oxygen, or what we call onload oxygen, in the alveol alveolar capillary space. And then um, the second role of, of the hemoglobin is in the, to transport the oxygen uh, to the tissues. And then third, it needs to offload that oxygen and deliver the oxygen to the tissues. Um, and that sounds fairly straightforward. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's an exceedingly complicated uh, process, and there are a lot of different things that have to happen. And um, hemoglobin being a protein, as we know, um, proteins uh, have what's known as a conformation. That, that is to say that they have a, a shape, because um, we know there are different levels of structure, up to four different levels. Uh, primary... Uh, the primary structure, which generally is the um, the amine bonds of, of the amino acids, uh, then there's the the secondary and tertiary structures, which are a little more specialized shapes. Uh, you get the beta pleated sheet, the alpha helix, and and, and so on and so forth. And that's generally um, or often um, in the form of hydrogen bonding. And then um, we get uh, the you know, this quaternary you know, level structure where we have uh, multiple uh, components of the, the proteins kind of come together and often you have uh, metals involved. Um, and, and the way that this is all shaped and comes together is known as a conformation. And, and when we change the shape of a protein, generally chemically, uh, pH, um, signaling molecules, uh, receptors, and so on and so forth, um, causes this, this conformational change and then, and then that protein um, will act a little differently. And, you know, as we talked about earlier in, in pathophysiology, sometimes the conformational changes are, are bad and, and sometimes are good. Um, I just want to talk about some of the, the, the normal conformational changes in, in hemoglobin. And I'm not going to talk about the chemistry specifically, but a, a more uh, a couple of different effects um, that are that are pretty well known and, and, and they're pretty profound and, and we need to appreciate them before we we go on to appreciating some of the the, the, the pathophysiology of oxygen which I, I believe we're going to talk about next week we talk about hypoxia and shock and so on okay so um, the, the first effect and, and really the, these effects that I'm talking about are actually properties of hemoglobin they actually um, these effects describe how hemoglobin acts in, in a certain uh, situation. And the, the first effect is, is something known as the, the Bohr effect. And um, if you guys are um, familiar with the name Bohr, you, uh, you, hopefully you're familiar with the name Bohr. If you've taken chemistry, which everyone has at this point, um, you should be familiar with Bohr. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Niels Bohr, of course, is, um, was instrumental in the quantum theory behind uh, the electron in the atom and uh, proposed the first um, quantized model of atomic theory which didn't turn out to be entirely correct uh, but it was a it was a giant step in, in the right direction well Niels Bohr uh, didn't have anything to do with the Bohr effect interestingly enough it was actually his father um, um, Father Bohr was a was a renowned uh, Danish uh, a physicist, um, or not physicist, excuse me, phys physiologist. Um, actually, uh, first coined this 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 or first uh, described this property of hemoglobin. Basically, what the Bohr effect is is it, um, it it states that hemoglobin has a decreased affinity for oxygen. Um, in, in the presence of uh, pH changes, high carbon dioxide, and so on and so forth. And um, what, is this, what does this mean? Well, if, if hemoglobin has a decreased affinity for oxygen, well, what is it going to do? Well, it's going to release oxygen. So the Bohr effect really describes um, how this hemoglobin, in, in the presence of, you know, let's say, high, high levels of acid, um, carbonic acid, hydrogen ions, uh, hydronium ions, um, will its conformation will change and it will release oxygen at, at the tissue level. And we want this to happen, right? We want hemoglobin to be able to release oxygen and, and the Bohr effect, at least in part, 
explains how hemoglobin does this. <clears throat> so the Bohr effect is associated with hemoglobin having a decreased affinity for oxygen, and then it releases oxygen, and, and we would hope that this would occur at the level of the tissues. However, this, 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 um, this concept, which is, which is actually known as a right shift, and we'll talk about right and left shift and oxyhemoglobin dissociation curves a little later on, probably in the next video, but uh, um, let's say that this were to happen in the lungs. Let's say this hemoglobin um, were, were to be experiencing the Bohr effect in the lungs. Well, this would potentially be catastrophic um, because the hemoglobin wouldn't necessarily want to onload, because we want hemoglobin to have a high affinity for oxygen in the lungs and a low affinity for oxygen in the tissues. So it can onload oxygen in the lungs, offload oxygen in the tissues. However, if uh, something were to happen to, to change this, this normal uh, way hemoglobin works, well, that could potentially be catastrophic. And, and you know, it could cause problems with, with oxygen delivery and extraction of oxygen to the tissues. Uh, another effect is known as the Haldane effect, also a uh, a, um, a famous uh, uh, physician, I believe, um, and basically what it says is that deoxygenated uh, deoxygenation of blood increases its ability to carry carbon dioxide. So, and the Haldane effect describes blood um, at the at the tissue level. We'll talk about that um, as blood um, releases oxygen to the tissues. Um, the hemoglobin is going to have an enhanced ability to carry carbon dioxide. Well, that's good um, because one of the ways we transport oxygen, even though you know most of it's transported in the form of bicarbonate, which we talked about earlier, there there is a, a fair a, a significant amount of it, uh, a fair percentage of it that's that's actually transported attached to hemoglobin, and, and they call that <clears throat> uh, excuse me. Um, uh, the carbon dioxide will attach to the hemoglobin and can be uh, transported uh, that way as well. And it, it's 10-15% um, maybe. Uh, I'm not quite exactly sure on those numbers. I know about 80% is bicarb, but still, you know, uh, one-tenth of it at least is going to be transported uh, attached to hemoglobin. So this is, this is pretty significant. It's a pretty significant way of, of transporting carbon dioxide. And then... Um, Oxygenated blood decreases its ability to carry carbon dioxide. Well, that's good. We want that to happen, right? Um, because as our blood becomes oxygenated in the um, the pulmonary capillary space, we want its affinity for CO2 to decrease, so it'll release CO2. So let's just go ahead and distill this and just say that the Haldane effect basically describes um, hemoglobin and its ability to carry carbon dioxide. And basically, uh, what the Haldane effect says is that um, at the level of the tissues, hemoglobin will onload carbon dioxide, and in the lungs, hemoglobin will offload carbon dioxide. Um, that's not entirely what I was trying to explain, but that's a good distilled way of looking at it, is that Haldane effect describes how hemoglobin wants to, to, to hold on to CO2 in the tissues and then release that CO2 in the lungs. Good thing. Uh, the Bohr effect is the affinity of oxygen, and, and basically what the Bohr effect says is at the tissue level, uh, hemoglobin will release oxygen, and then in the capillary, in, in the lungs, uh, hemoglobin will um, want to um, onload or want to bind with oxygen. And these two effects, the Bohr and the Haldane effect, are complementary, and we want them to work like they normally would work. Now, when hemoglobin doesn't work normally, and there are alterations in the way hemoglobin interacts with oxygen, and, and to some extent carbon dioxide, we run into some problems, and we'll talk about that in the next video about the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Okay, everyone, thanks for hanging in there, and uh, have a great day.